Today, my featured guest is Preston Poor, and Preston is a corporate business leader. He has more than two decades of upper-level management experience, most of which has been at the Coca-Cola Company as Director of Franchise Leadership. Prior to that, though, Preston worked for the Hershey Company, Dale Carnegie Training, Ralston Perina, and AmSouth Bank. Preston is also a certified John Maxwell team coach, speaker, and trainer, and through his new book, Discipled Leader, that's you, BC Nation. You are called to be a leader of disciples, but first, you must be discipled. So many of us skip that step. Uh, Preston seeks in his new book to increase the discipleship and leadership skills of Christians across the country. You can find more about him at PrestonPoor.com. That's Preston, P-O-O-R-E. Dot com. Preston, welcome to Broken Catholic, number one podcast on iTunes for Protestants and Catholics. Go ahead and take about 30 seconds. Just fill in some of the gaps in that intro, would you? Hey, Joseph. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, real quick, uh, thanks for mentioning some of the career things. I'm first and foremost a, a dad and a husband. been married for 29 years to my lovely bride, Carla, and I've got two young adult children, Caroline and Ben, that both live here in Atlanta right now. And uh, just excited about that. So that's my priority. Uh, my relationship with the Lord, my family, and then work. So those are the three. You know, you set it in the right order. And you know how many people have that order disordered? And that's why their life looks disordered. What made you, uh, how did you get that priority correct? Like, <laughs> I'm sure there was a time in your life maybe where it wasn't. Oh, yeah. there's There's been all kinds of times. Um you know, it's it's one I've always heard that the worst four letter word out there is S E L F, self, right? And um, I I became a Christian when I was in eighth grade, uh, gave my life to the Lord, and there's been a whole journey on that. Gosh, it's been a, a forty plus year journey, um, and I've gone back and forth between a, a tight relationship with the Lord and not. But I found that if I get those things things out of order, then everything else starts to fall apart. And uh, I saw, I remember seeing an umbrella, Joseph, one time and, and showed me uh, the image was this, that is if you step or if you're underneath an umbrella being God and the protection you're and you're leaning in with him, he will protect you and bless you. And uh, even though you might have challenges, uh, et cetera, but if you step outside of that umbrella, which I've done a few times in my life and it ain't pretty, things get messed up. Relationships get messed up. Uh, business focus met, gets messed up. I've got a lot of those things in the book. Uh, about how I really struggled and, and uh, faced adversity and worked through those things. But I tell you what, if you keep them aligned, you're going to be in much better shape than if they're misaligned. Yeah, I agree and resonate personally in my own journey as well. Take a minute, share something personal about you, Preston, that very few people in your business life actually know. Uh, it's one thing I brought out in the book, and uh, it, it's something that I struggled to share for a long, long time with people. But uh, I was born with a uh, genetic disease called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. And uh, it's a really where the sheath and the neurons, if you know anything about uh, uh, medicine, uh, the sheath and the neurons are what help connect uh, the, the nerves, if you will, and send signals. Mm -hmm. And it's a genetic disease, and it's progressive. And uh, I've had it ever, obviously, since I was born with it, but it's just gotten worse over time. I've had corrective surgery around it. You might, uh, if you ever saw me walk, you'd see me walk with a little bit of a limp. Mm. Um, but I've been ashamed of it for a long, long time. It's actually the number one, uh, one of the, I think it's the number one disease that nobody knows about. One in 2,500 people in America have Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. It's a uh, uh, peripheral neuro neuropathy it's easy for me to say, what, in the peripheral neuropathy. Um, so that's how, not, how does that limit you in your life or where has that held you back or caused you the most frustration? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm very competitive. I love sports. Uh, I uh, loved football uh, to play, you know, pick up that football, flag football. I was never big enough really to play uh, regular in high school. But I played tennis, basketball, all the other stuff, skied, and uh, just loved those things. I uh, can't do those as much anymore. Uh, I'm kind of limited in what I do uh, around that. But the, the great thing about that is, Joseph, is that it, uh, it helps me understand where I place my joy. And it helped mm -hmm. me discover other talent, skills, and abilities that God has given me beyond my um, uh, physical limitation, if you will, or challenges. So uh, God's given me the ability to speak in public, uh, to write, uh, to solve problems, to collaborate uh, with others, to accomplish great things. And so 
Um, that's the kind of cool thing about it. There are things that I can't do, but I don't feel a victim to it. Uh, what I try to do is excel in other things. And I watched my dad who has the same thing. Mm. Uh, and he's a fantastic, he's a PhD from Caltech. He started a business uh, and has done a wonderful job and has been a role model for me in that and uh, really supportive in that. So uh, that's something I don't share with many people uh, on it, but that's a, that's, a, that's a weakness, but it's also a strength, if you will. Yeah. And I acknowledge you for not letting that thorn in the flesh, thorn in your side, uh, become an excuse for your life. Yeah. Many people get caught up in that trap, right? I yeah. did in certain areas. Yeah, you can become a victim and you can be woe is me. Uh, Self-pity is another just an awful thing to be full of. Uh, so I just make that choice. I, I make it on a daily basis. I, I, I get frustrated by things. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? I, I, I have a beautiful wife and a lovely wife. And I told her about my challenge 30 years ago before we got married. And uh, uh, she just looked at me and said, not a big deal, right? She accepted me for who I am. And she has been very supportive over the years. Um, and uh, so it's just, I'm, I'm not a victim, no self-pity, uh, but I do want to overcome the challenge and use it. And the great thing is, is that I, when I do share it with people, it gives this ability maybe to realize that Preston is not perfect. He's not the person, he's not just a face on a book, uh, but he has real challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I can connect and help direct people in terms of how to see themselves and how to have confidence and how to build their talent, skills, and abilities to serve God, um, gosh, that's a win. That's awesome. That's a big win. Okay. So your book is Discipled Leadership. And before you can become a leader, you have to become a great follower, right? That's right. A great follower of Christ. So speak to us about that in your own life. What did that actually look like for you to first become that discipled follower uh, before you became the discipled leader? Take us through that story real quick, please. Yeah, um, this is kind of a memoir, if you will, this book, this journey uh, that I wrote. And um, you've, I know, you've, Joseph, you've probably heard of the secular, spiritual, or sacred divide that's out there. Uh, it's kind of funny. I don't know if you're, your listeners or you're familiar with Barna, but they're a Christian re research organization. And uh, they did a study um, called Christians at Work, about 1,500 Christians that said their faith mattered to them somewhat. And they found that 72% of folks don't actually integrate their faith into the workplace. And what does that mean for me? Well, I, I, was, uh, I had great leadership uh, in the church. I grew up in youth groups, uh, served. I was an elder in a church. Uh, but I always struggled to translate and transfer what I was learning in church into the workplace. And so there was a period of breaking in my life, in my career. Uh, back in 2004, 2005, I had some really tough circumstances that went along, lost some employees, thinking that self and uh, self-promotion and performance were going to get me to the top of an organization. And I quickly came to realize, well, I won't say quickly, it's probably an embellishment, but uh, God got through this thick skull of mine that uh, I needed to focus on people first. And I wasn't doing that. I really wasn't. And so that was really where this journey all began for me is I took that spiritual and the uh, secular divide. And, and if you think about it as a Venn diagram, I, I show people this. It, if you take those two separate circles and start to pull them together and live in the overlap. So my spiritual life is my life. And so I'm the same person at home as I am at work or in the community, et cetera. Um, just a, it was a journey for me. And uh, really, that's what this book is about, is kind of how, to, how do we help people understand that first to become a disciple of Christ, lean into Jesus, know him, be his friend, uh, uh, develop an intimate fellowship with him, and then God will work in you and through you to accomplish some just amazing things in the workplace. Mm. What was the biggest challenge that you faced when you started to incorporate your faith into your business? And maybe those around you were like... Why are you acting this way? Why are you acting different? Why are you showing up different? You know, there's no place for God here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've got a story that I share with folks. Um, I was put in charge of uh, an engagement team at uh, the company that I'm with. I've done that a couple of times and led that. Engagement simply in the business world is just the level of discretionary effort a uh, employee is willing to put forth in their job based on their relationship with their direct manager or their environment, the work environment they're in. And so uh, if you look at Gallup, uh, they say that 30% of uh, associates out there are engaged, the balance aren't. That's not a good thing, we need people engaged. Uh, but I was put in charge of helping to, uh, after we got in some engagement surveys, to figure out what 
to do to turn that around in our company because engagement wasn't very good. And Joseph, I remember overhearing a conversation uh, after I had moved to Atlanta and they heard about me getting put into a role like this. And they said, who's going to show up? The Knoxville Preston or the Atlanta Preston? So the Knoxville Preston that I used to live there was the one that was uh, uh, went through that period of self and just tough relationships at work uh, and, and brokenness. And then when I went through a course called Christian Leadership Concepts in Knoxville, that was really the, the catalyst for me to make these changes. Uh, the Lord working in me and through me and then uh, showed up in Atlanta probably a little bit differently uh, because God, I, I leaned to him, I surrendered to him. And I asked him, I said, and Joseph, I remember this in 2005, I, I just said, hey, Lord, I've tried everything on my own. I've tried to lead. Uh, I know you've knit, knit me a certain way, but I've, I've, I'm trying to do this uh, by myself. I can't do it. And so if you will take what I've got, which ain't much, and just help me and shape me the way that you want me to be, I will surrender myself to you. And uh, it was in that breaking, really, that point um, where I really got to the end of my rope <laughs> and all that was left was God. And uh, that's where the, rehabilit the rehabilitation started. He started working in me. Uh, and that's why I talk so much about first about being before doing. It's you've got to, you know, who you are, uh, that disposition within you that Christ puts in you has to change first before you move into leading others. And um, that's a big, big part of it. And so that, those are the struggles. And that's kind of a little bit of the journey that I went on uh, at work and, and kind of a tipping point for me back in 2005. Mm. Thank you for sharing that vulnerable story. Mm. Let me ask you this. Do you think it's possible for a Christian uh, to become a discipled leader without fully surrendering to Christ like you had to, or without fully coming to the edge of their self or the end of their own rope, maybe they're close, but can they still be a discipled leader at that point? You know, um, I think it's a great question. I, I, I think there are a lot of wonderful leaders that are out there, Joseph, that aren't Christians, right? So uh, leadership is a, is a quality. We're all creatures of uh, uh, made in the image of God. Um, what, and I've heard John Maxwell say this, that, you know, you have the potential that you're not tapping into, like divine insight, wisdom. And if you're not in that and understanding what God's direction is for you in your daily life, in your business decisions, uh, you're not going to reach that full potential and uh, excel and grow like you might otherwise. So that's why it's so important. Um, when you become a Christian, you surrender your life to Christ. Uh, there should be a growth process that happens. There's another stat I'm going to throw at you real quick, if you don't mind. I'm a business guy, so I like statistics. Um, Barna said that 80% of Christians that made a decision for Christ at some point in their life have not been or are not currently being discipled. And what I mean by discipleship? Well, it's nobody's been taught how to read the Bible. They don't know how to pray. They don't know the importance of fellowship and being with a church body, connected to that, small groups, things like that, or they don't know how to share their faith openly. And so if that 80% doesn't know how to do those things, how the heck are they going to learn how to, to be a, a Christian disciple leader in the workplace? And that's the whole thing about this book is that it recognizes there's different audiences out there. If you haven't been disciple, you don't know those things, you first need to grow in Christ. Uh, and that's what it, Barna called compartmentalizers. If they keep the separate, uh, the sacred and the spiritual separate, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, secular and the spiritual separate, and they're not discipled, they can't progress into that. And then there's another group that they call, they have the compartmentalizers. Then they move to this other group called onlookers. And onlookers are the ones that are a little bit more interested in church and say, hey, if you'll show me and model for me what it looks like to be a Christian leader in the workplace, I'm willing to try. And then 28% are actually what they found in the survey was that uh, uh, they're actually integrators. They live out their faith in the workplace. They actively use their talent, skills, and abilities to uh, be a redemptive influence, meaning that they make things better and actually live a, a more fulfilling life. So it's a long way around the bush to say that I think you can be a, a good leader, uh, but you can be a great leader if you lean into the Lord and be discipled and have him work in you and through you. 
So what I heard from all that is that without going through the surrendering process of your ego, uh, your plans and schemes and surrendering it all to God. And typically it's a painful process. It's a, I believe it's a crucifixion, right? And, and then you go in the tomb for a little while of like, God, where are you? I surrendered everything. How yeah. come I'm not seeing results uh, before you come out the other side? Uh, but without going through that process, uh, you will not be used by God whole and complete the way you're meant to. You can still do good in the world, but you won't be at your full capacity. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the way I view it. I really do. Um, you know, it's, it's a process that it's a theological term called sanctification. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we become more Christ-like. Uh, I was reading Oswald Chambers in My Utmost for His Highest this morning. Some of your listeners might be familiar with that. But uh, it was talking about how Jesus puts his disposition in us so we can live out the life that he calls us to. If we try to live these principles out on our own, I was reading the, uh, the Beatitudes this morning was in my quiet time. So I read that. And uh, it, it, Christ set such a high bar that if we try to live the life that he, he proposes without the Holy Spirit in our life, we'll never do it. And it's a, it, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. And so if we can tap into that, that energy through the Holy Spirit that he gives us to work in us and through us, the insight, the change, all those things, God moves us in, a, in his direction and uh, will work in us and through us. If you could give my listener the most practical advice you could for them to start integrating their faith into their workplace, what would you tell them? Well, I'd start to talk about what does a disciple look like first and format, foremost. And um, one of the key things that we talk about early on in the book is, number one, we talk about the importance of the Bible, uh, its uh, divine nature, uh, its authority, its inspired. And then I ask people, if that's the case, and it's been around all these years, why don't we invest more time in it, with it, reading it, uh, going through its pages, studying it, memorizing scripture? And one of the key things that I mentioned to all folks that I ever have a chance to talk about this stuff to is about a quiet time. And that's your daily appointment with God. And I asked them, do you have a daily quiet time? What does that look like for you? Do you have a place where you go in the morning, afternoon, evening? What's that look like for you? Uh, do you have scripture that you read? Do you meditate on it? Do you memorize it? Do you pray? And uh, typically, a lot of people don't do that. And they're managed by the tyranny of the urgent. And I would encourage anybody that wants to become and go down this path as a disciple leader is to one, what you have really keyed on today, Joseph, is surrendering your, life, surrendering your life and saying, Lord, I need you. But then there are the tenets, the principles, and the practices that typical disciples that have been handed down over all these years uh, that help you become a productive and effective Christian. And I would point them first really to the Bible, reading it, uh, getting engaged in a quiet time. And then what that ultimately does is we take people on a journey in that, because if you're in God's word, it will help you make better decisions. It will make you help or help you make better decisions because you are gaining and gleaning insight from God's word. If you're seeking his will, he'll help you make those decisions. Now, not every decision turns out really well, right? Uh, but I venture to say, and I've seen this in my own life and other people, that if you're trusting God and leaning into him, looking for his direction, he will help you. So that's probably the first thing I'd say on their journey to, to become a disciple leader. So BC Nation, for you today, two practical steps is first surrender the rest of your life for God, maybe the first half of your life or first 75% of your life for some of you out there. Uh, you have spent, like I did, glorifying yourself. It's all about your plans and schemes, not God's. So the first step is to surrender the rest of your life, whatever that may look like, to him. All in. Lord, take whatever is still remains. It belongs to you anyway. Let me glorify you with it, right? So that full surrender, that dying to self, your egoic false self. And then the second thing is quiet time with God every single day that uh, classroom of silence, right? That's where you're going to learn with the creator of the universe. You wanna do better in business? You wanna make more money in business? You wanna make more profit in business? Then the wisdom is found with the creator of the universe. Who better to sit with 
than the one that created all the beauty around us. Best, best mathematician, uh, best uh, bookkeeper, right, in the universe right there. So, like, there's so much uh, business wisdom, financial wisdom uh, that God will give you if you just sit in his presence. And that's all he really wants is his children just to show up and spend time with dad. That's it. That's right. Awesome. Absolutely. And then bring dad into their lives, invite dad into the details of their life. No different than your children want you as a parent in the details of their life, except during the age of, you know, tween, right? Then, then they want nothing to do with you, that's but right. that's just emotional <laughs> problems going on there. So Preston, uh, what would you like to add uh, that to my listener uh, contribute to my listener that we have not spoke about um, that you really want to convey and pour into their life. I I would tell folks this is that we invest. Well, let me put it another way. You can either spend time or invest time. You really can. And studies show that we spend, if you will, maybe not invest 90,000 hours of our lives at work. And work is really where God can put us in points in, in areas of sanctification it's where we get to know ourselves, how to relate to others, exercise our talents, skills, and abilities. And so the question becomes, what do you do with those 90,000 hours? And I would encourage people to recognize that if they will just lean into the Lord and seek him and surrender themselves to him, they're going to have a tremendous, tremendous relationship with God. And they're going to see some transformation in their lives and the lives around them. I f- f- fully believe that transform lives, transform cultures. And uh, God will work in you and through you and make a big difference around you. It's awesome. And I'm going to complete this part of our conversation today with a very uh, revealing question. So if you were being 100% transparent right now, in what area of your life do you still struggle to trust God? Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, there's a lot. So where do I begin? You got another half hour? We can chat, Joseph. What's what's the number one area the, that the you resist? Um, it has been an amazing journey uh, writing this book for me, uh, a journey of faith. And I have listened to the lies that uh, you're not ready to launch the book. Um, it's not going to do well. No one cares. Um, and so you know, it's funny. I, I, I talk a lot of people about uh, our negative. I'm not espousing positive thinking as a solution to all this, but I do want to share with people that statistics show us that seven out of 10 thoughts that we have every day are negative. And so how do I change those thoughts and work with the Lord, read the scripture and adjust that from maybe six out of 10 instead of seven out of 10. But I really struggle with the self-doubt. Um, and am I worthy? Uh, is this really going to happen? And what, you know what, Joseph, in the midst of all that, I still struggle with the confidence on it, but God has been so faithful, so faithful in this journey. And I know we will be in the future. I only have to look back to trust him in the future, uh, because I see what he's done. Don't know exactly what all this looks like from here on out, which is cool. That's part of the adventure. Um, but I really struggle with confidence and self-doubt. Thank you for that. I know my audience, my listener is resonating big time. Their hand is waving in the air saying, yep, yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Seven out of 10 thoughts are negative BC nation. I mean, how true is that? And, and I don't even know how many of those seven thoughts, maybe five or six are lies. They're not even just negative thoughts. They're lies targeted at your identity, who you are, right? Those are those that's spiritual warfare. Those are attacks of the enemy. It's just not like bad thoughts. There are actual arrows coming let at me, you. Go if ahead. I can with your uh, listeners real quick, let me read this real quick. If you can't, don't mind. Uh, it says 12 to 60,000 thoughts per day that we all have as many as 98% of them are exactly the same ones we had before. This self-talk is often unconstructive and damaging uh, seven out of ta- uh, seven out of ten thoughts we have each day are negative. So do the math. That's forty eight thousand negative thoughts daily. 
You don't believe me? Think about the lies in your inner critic. I talk about the inner critic in the book, what they say every day. I'm unworthy. I can't lead. I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. No one loves me or cares for me. I don't belong anywhere. I have no purpose. I'm weak. This will never work. I must be perfect. It's too late to pursue my dream. And all I do in the book is I turn that around and make those positive statements, right? And those are a bunch of lies that we tell ourselves. But think about that number, that impact on you. Uh, if you have 48,000 thoughts daily that are negative, and what if you could just change a few of those? And I'm not, again, not espousing positive thinking. It's just that we are so hard on ourselves. And I would encourage the listeners to, to, um, uh, to try to think differently. Listen, I completely get what you're saying. That's what I do in my coaching. I have something called a Rafa session where uh, clients get to book uh, one to two hours of time with me where we literally go in and, with God and it's a prayer healing uh, session and God goes in and completely obliterates those lies that we've been repeating to ourselves 48,000 times a day that have become our truth not his truth, our truth. And those lies have been guiding our lives. Imagine what your life would look like if God went in surgically, like the great physician he is, and removed those lies that weigh you down day after day. Imagine how much more energy you would have. Imagine how much more clarity you would have, how much more hope you would have, and energy and drive to pursue what God's calling you to. Imagine the confidence that you would have, right? This is what we're talking about, right? So I get to, to do this in one session, right? And it's not me. I'm just like facilitating a conversation with God with you, right? The, whoever the client is. And God just goes in and like just removes these lies one after another. And, and people come out like, I feel so much lighter. Oh my gosh, I just feel like something's gone, something left. And Many of them are just in tears, right? Because something's leaving them. Lies are pouring out of them. And they get a fresh slate. They get a new start with God. That's a beautiful thing. So I just want to share that because it was very relevant to what you just said, Preston. Okay. So, uh, Preston, welcome to my favorite part of the show. Welcome to the confession round. I'm going to ask you 10 quick fire questions. You'll have about three seconds to answer each don't overthink it. It's just for fun. Are you ready, sir? Bring it. Let's go. What's your favorite thing about God? Uh, his love for me. What is your least favorite thing about God? Some of the adversity I've gone through. Yeah. What are you most afraid of? Uh, disappointing others and God. Mm -hmm. I believe we're all struggling with something at any given moment of our life. You already mentioned confidence and self-doubt. Uh, what else are you struggling with either professionally or personally right now? Uh, pride. Just got off of a big book launch and uh, words of affirmation are mine and I can get puffed up. And so I'm trying to guard against that, if you will. Gotcha. What did you spend way too much time doing this past year? Uh, social media, hands down social media. Yeah. What secret fear do you have about people? that they uh, don't like me, don't approve. Got it. What do you wish you had learned sooner about God? I wish I had learned more about grace. More yeah. about grace. Not, not, it's not performance-based. It's, it's um, you know, about grace. Freely given, right? That's right. What's a new habit you want to create? Oh, that's great. Uh, not drinking as much coffee. <laughs> I probably should rephrase this question. It should probably be, what's a new habit you're going to create? <laughs> right? Then, then my, my guess is like, ah, ah, ah. Yeah, well, I've been procrastinating. <laughs> what's a bad habit you're going to break? Oh, gosh. I sharpen the questions. Uh, you know what? A bad habit is I, I, have a, I struggle sleeping. And so I've got to develop the habit of sleeping better and uh, getting seven to eight hours of sleep. I'm at five to six best right now. Hmm. Pick three words to describe who you are now. Oh, thankful. Um, loving. And different. Yeah. Pick three words to describe who you are before uh, you fully surrendered the rest of your life to God. Pain in the ass. Jerk. Too serious. 
Hey, why are you calling out all my peeps, man? <laughs> <laughs> and last question, Preston, if you could come back to life after you died, look your family and your friends, all your loved ones in the eye and give them only one piece of advice about everything, life, death, God, relationships, business. What would you say to them? God is real. Trust him. Any final wisdom? What's the one thing you want my listener to know about fully giving everything to God and trusting him? Uh, the, there's I, this book, this book and this message will help you move from where you are now to where you have the potential to go. And if you'll just lean in and be intentional and just like Joseph has mentioned about the surrender it will make a huge difference for you. It's chock full of scripture. It's all about Jesus. And it's also all, also about him working in you and through you. If you will just take a chance, take a risk and hear today what we've been talking about and go apply it, it will make a huge difference, huge difference in your life. Awesome. And where does my listener go to pick up your book, find out more about you? What do you got for them? Uh, well, the book is now available wherever you buy a book. It's uh, in retail outlets, online, uh, like Amazon.com, et cetera. And you can visit my website at PrestonPoor.com. That's P-R-E-S-T-O-N-P-O-O-R-E.com. Okay, BC Nation, we've been speaking with Preston Poor, and he revealed to you and to me the three secrets to becoming a discipled leader. That's what we're going to call this episode, I think. That's how we'll title it. I like it. It's catchy. It's hooky. Makes you want to know. What are the three secrets? I got to know. All right, Preston, thank you for being on Broken Catholic. I wish you God's love, peace, and joy in your life, sir. Thank you, Joseph. It's been an honor.